Hello everyone, and welcome back to another interview on Human. Today we will be interviewing Renato Rampola, a lens-based photographer who has recently focused his attention or his lens on the homeless population, also known as the Invisible Society. Through a book, he has recently came out with a book uh, several years back called Dignity No Matter What, The Light Within. Today, we will be learning more about him and his story. Give us a second as we bring him on. Hello. Hey. Hey. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Troy? Good, good. Not too bad. Can you uh, shift the camera a little bit more down okay. so we can see your, uh, yeah, there you go. You want to see the whole, you know, your whole face, uh, along with the pictures in the background. Looking oh, nice, man. Looking nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. Yes, indeed. Um, I have a wide range of uh, questions for you here today <laughs> about your life, you know. So we're just going to go ahead and dive into uh, this interview. So for those who don't know you, uh, please tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I have a passion for photography and making images, whether painting and mixing them with my photography or just doing photography by itself. I love to travel and like walk, just going around different states and different cities and uh, taking pictures. And as an artist, one of the things that artists try to do is have the view of their art look at things in a different way so if I'm walking down and I see a, a torn uh, poster and it makes it kind of a cool image I'll take a picture of that and try to show it in such a way that you may not have noticed it you may have called it a torn, torn poster when you walk by it but when you see my image of it you'll see it as something else and mm. that, that is really cool so when I'm walking and then I see a person a homeless person and um, that if I'm calling attention to cool things like torn posters, I mean I should be to, uh, calling attention to people that that are on the street. I mean these people are basically invisible. When I take a picture of them and you see in one of my images, you're looking eye to eye. You're seeing them. You're seeing their soul. Mm. So beautifully said. Me in a nutshell, I, I like uh, taking pictures and making images. My background was in music years ago. And um, yeah, that's what I like to do. Nice, nice. Well, we're going to get dive deep into your life story as of right now. So I wanted to start off with more of your upbringing. So I wanted to uh, ask you, where are you originally from? I was born in Boston. And then uh, when I was six months old, I was moved to Sarasota. Was, my father was an artist, and he got a teaching position at the Ringling uh, College of, of, of Art. And I, my mother became the den mother. And I was there for the first four or five years living on campus. And my father had a studio underneath. And uh, so it was, it was an interesting experience. I've got pictures of my fourth birthday, just four years old, and, I, and surrounded by college girls, you know. And then I, no, no kids my own age. It was just all college girls. So I'm, I guess I, I had a lot of attention when I was young. And I used to hang around in my father's studio. And, um, yeah, so it, 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 it was kind of cool. And then my father got a job at USF, the University of South Florida in Tampa, and started teaching there. And uh, that's how I ended up coming to Tampa. Mm -hmm. and, um, let's see. I, I ended up being, a, I had a music scholarship, play guitar, and I taught guitar in various music stores. And I, on, I remember every Tuesday morning, I would take my camera and I would go around taking pictures of people in uh, what's called Ybor City, which is a National Historic District. It's really a, a wonderful place to take pictures or to visit. And yes, yes. Every Tuesday morning before I had to go teach guitar in the afternoon. Um, wow. Cause I, yeah, so it, it's, it, and then I played in, in uh, top 40 bands and rock bands and stuff like that at night. And um, eventually got my uh, degree in history, social and behavioral sciences with history. and. Um, uh, got into real estate because I'm thinking, ah, I need to make a living, you know. So uh, that 
became my life. You know, having to raise a family, got into real estate. Uh, I, I kind of put the music a little bit on hold, although I kept playing at night because I needed the money. And uh, I put the camera away, got rid of it. And and I took up took up just only recently, five years ago, uh, started shooting again. Well, I have questions about all those different phases of your life that I've uh, been able to put yeah. together. Uh, but I do want to ask you, what activities did you do when you were younger? Uh, I know times are very different then. Um, I know times are very different now. So back in the day, <laughs> compared to back then to what we have nowadays, you know, we have uh, TikTok, Instagram, uh, these things that, you know, definitely take away the youth's attention. Uh, but I know back then there wasn't that. So what activities did y'all do back in the day that are different from what we do nowadays? Well, we didn't have cameras back then, security cameras. So uh, I can't tell you everything, okay? <laughs> but we got a lot away with a lot more. But but as far as the stuff I can talk about, I played my guitar a lot. I was really good at guitar. Um, I had friends. It was really cool because I remember in high school, uh, basically I was playing bands from country bands to funk bands to rock bands to blues bands. So I had such a you want to call it culture, a cross-cultural experience in high school, it was amazing. And there's a lady I had the opportunity of playing with, her name is Kitty Daniels, and they just made a documentary about her. She mm -hmm. sings like Billie Holiday, and this lady was phenomenal, and is phenomenal. She's still alive. She's still playing. Um, but I, I have recordings of her. I used to go to her house. And it, it, there was a guy named Herbie Myers, wonderful guy, beautiful singer. He's passed away. And his son mm -hmm. played bass, Ricky. And uh, we'd hire different drummers. And um, Kitty would show me all these jazz turnarounds. She played kind of like Oscar Peterson, but she sang like Billie Holiday. And she was so frigging good. And she is, I keep saying, talking past tense, only because I haven't seen her in so long. But, but no, she's still around. She's doing well. What is, what is a jazz turn? I've never heard that. Turnarounds are like when you need to go from one point to another. You'll do what's like a two five one, and you'll do like mm -hmm. a, a two like the uh, A minor seven to D nine to G. Right, that's a two five one. Mm -hmm. uh, but she'll have all, all these ways that they um, substitute other chords for those. So wow. it's jazzy. That's that's the best way to put it. It sounds really cool. And I was young, you know, and. Uh, I didn't know any of that stuff. So she, she was really patient with me. And I've got her on tape. She's actually calling out the chords to me as we're playing Green Dolphin Street. And I'm trying to comp along and, you know, keeping my volume turned down low so I don't mess it up too bad. But anyway. But, yeah, so that was really a wonderful point in my life. Um, and and um, so I would play guitar a lot. That was what I did a lot. Um, um, and then, you know, the stuff that I can't talk about, but, you know, <laughs> no, I, 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 I was pretty clean. I didn't get in much trouble. I got you. Um, what is one difference you can point out about communication back in the day compared to what it is now? <clears throat> um, back in the day, like in the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the phones were attached to the wall, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know so there's there's a it's a whole different thing um i remember riding our bikes and we go to the way you know your friend is home is if his bike's out front you know and mm -hmm. if his bike's out in front the front door well you know your friend's home um bikes were man that was our in, that was our independence i mean we before we could afford a car we were driving bikes every riding bikes everywhere wow do you believe that uh, communication had more authenticity when you said you was going to meet up with someone that the person actually came and met up with you? I feel yeah, like nowadays, uh, due to the point when on. everybody's like, oh, I'm coming, and then they don't really have to show up. It's like a different mode of communication. Well, yeah, not, not just that, but just the connection was real. You know, mm -hmm. it kind of goes into one whole body of work I'm working on is introspection, where we're not really in touch with each other you and i haven't met face to face but we're we're talking and you know we have a pretty good feel of things but it's still not the same as shaking your hand giving you a hug you know walking around together you know that kind of thing it's just different and um it's great it's you know don't get me wrong you know but it 
it, it's not a substitute for the real thing. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not a substitute for the real thing. I agree with that 100%. Wow. That was a very good answer, by the way. Did you grow up in a two-parent household, by the way? Uh, until I was 11, and then my father mm -hmm. died. And that kind of shook our world because he didn't have any insurance. So uh, it was really tough. And my mom had a high school education. And uh, I remember she, she was working at um, Kmart, which is like a Walmart, Kmart. And in the mm -hmm. part, like $2 an hour. And I was mowing yards. So we, we made do, you know, then uh, – and then not only did he not have insurance, he didn't have a will. So – We'd have all the vultures coming out. Oh, he owed up for art supplies or this or that. So we have what was called probate. When you're in probate, she even his car, she couldn't sell for money. It sat there for like a year and a half. So finally, mm -hmm. the attorney that was, my father knew a lot of people because in the art world, you know, a lot of times people barter art for with uh, uh, dental services or art services. And so we had a, a an attorney that was named Arnie Levine, who was a, a big attorney in the area and came in and helped us and helped her get the whole probate thing uh, finished and all that. So, but yeah, it was a little tight, you know, and my mom was so strong, you know, she was just an amazing, uh, I can't think of a better mother, you know, I mean, you, my mom. Do you want to adjust the, do you want to adjust the phone? Okay. Because I'm because every time it moves, it becomes like a rip. Okay. Let me see. Uh -oh. Oh, yeah, no. Take How is that? Is it too dark? Yeah, it's a little too dark. Um, do you have a uh, extra light? <clears throat> no problem. There you go. Is that okay? There we go. That's great. Okay. Yeah, that's you can clearly okay. see you clearly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm um, by a window and we lost. It got someone behind a cloud. Yeah, yeah, I see. The sun is uh, definitely lost. I had to close my blinds so the light doesn't take away from my face here. Um, moving forward, though, I wanted to ask, what is a life lesson that both your parents taught you separately? What is one that your father taught you, and what is one that your mother taught you? Um, when I talk about my father, I would say the lesson was learned long after his death. And the lesson was, in his art, was be bold and do what you want want to do don't worry about trying to sell your work or trying to please a, uh, an audience do what you have to do that's something i learned from my and i totally admire him for that my mm -hmm. mother i uh, i learned basically gosh my ethics the strength uh she was just the strongest person i know i mean she was a you know, you know people it was hard a single mom you know and and she didn't remarry and she just had me, and um, it was tough. And so I learned to be strong. Nice, right. When your father passed, when your father passed uh, at eleven years old, what impact did this have on you? Well, I was getting a little bit courtly, to be honest with you. I was getting a little heavy, and I lost the weight that summer. I mean, I just, I don't know if it was depression or what it was, but I just lost weight and uh, got where I really, the weight I should have been. And um, mm. it was kind of tough, you know, it, it, was, it was something, uh, it, it's, it's really tough now in the sense of, I, there's so many questions I would love to talk to my father as now that I'm an adult about some of the th things that he painted and some of the concept about what we first started talking about connectivity because a lot of times in his paintings you'll see two figures and they they look alone you know and where are they coming from and it's so prophetic because now you can be in a room with someone else and they're on a the phone you're on a phone someone else is on a computer and you're not connecting you know and it's yeah so yeah wow. i would love to talk to my father as an adult as me, as me being an adult that's amazing. The way you said it's so prophetic because it does speak to today's times. You're absolutely correct about that. Maybe he felt something was coming, man. You know, the spirit doesn't lie. Yeah. For sure. Um, as your father being a renowned artist and educator at Ringling College of Art and University of South Florida, did this make you want to leave 
behind your own legacy and how did this influence your success that you have today? No, I, I, at that point, no. Um, I was just worried about trying to make a living. I was playing guitar and I was teaching guitar. And uh, so that's why I ended up going into real estate. I wasn't really thinking about, you know, being famous or making, you know, I just, anything beyond making a living. I kind of just like, well, it, I didn't want to be, you know, this sounds bad. I didn't want to be poor, you know, because I've, I've been without and I don't, I didn't like it, you know, growing up. So I had this need to be more successful. And, and this is not taking anything away from my parents at all, because I, I was, I, I had all the privileges, you know, it's just, I didn't, you know, it was, it was, there were some tough times. I mean, every night it was, ham if we ate dinner, it would be ham hamburger helper or tuna helper. And I, I just, you know, I just didn't want to be like that. You know, and so I, I really focused on on um, basically trying to make a living. Interesting. And how how does how did when he did uh, influence your success today with photography? Do you think that there was any correlation between the two? What he was doing then at the arts with within the arts that then kind of rubbed off on you in the later years. It doesn't even have to impact you when you were younger. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I think I, I just did a little um, email that goes out to my subscribers talking about that. And um, just the, the, the things that he, he did about the belief in a higher, higher power, belief in um, uh, the inner, you know, the lack of human connection, uh, man's mm -hmm. ability to basically be inhumane to his fellow man, all mm -hmm. these things about human condition or what I've been doing and kind of not really realizing it. And um, as I'm learning, I, I obviously the Dignity series is pretty obvious because I'm, I'm making visible people that are basically invisible because they live on the streets and we don't look at them eye to eye. We just maybe give them a dollar and, and move on and feel good about ourselves, you know. But we don't necessarily, not everybody, but we don't necessarily sit down and talk to them, find out the story or, you know, because Really, it doesn't matter how much money a, a homeless person gets, they're not going to fix the demons inside of them until they get their own self-respect. And the only way to get self-respect is for people to say, hey, Jim, what's going on? You know, what you doing today? You know, that, yeah. that kind of thing. Just talk to them and, and not talk down to them. Just talk to them. Yes. I love what you said. There. That is very good information. I think some other people are definitely going to have to hear that. Um, now, I did see that you owned a mowing business when you were younger. Oh. Obviously, the heart of, you know, the entrepreneur beat it from a young time within you. And uh, I was wondering, uh, how was it owning a business mowing a lawn at a young age? And what did this experience teach you about business? Well, the, the, I think saying it was a business was more it, it, mm -hmm. it's kind of euphemistic. It was really a job I made for myself, you know? If I was smarter, I would have had a couple other guys working with me and, you know, charge them. I would get five dollars for this big lot, you know, this, this, this corner corner lot, you know, uh, Mrs. Daniels had. I remember at five dollars, I think, oh, my God, that'd be like fifty dollars today. And I, <laughs> what I should have been doing is just, you know, basically saying um, I, I'll give you three dollars to mow this thing and and then make two dollars and have other guys working for me other kids my own age working for me but i didn't that, that would have been more of a business but not i i had a job but it i did do really well because i i towed my mower behind my bike and and went and did several block radius of, of the house and i did and this was we didn't have like blowers we had an edger but didn't you know usually it was just a mow you know and in my neighborhood it wasn't like a really um a fancy neighborhood where they, you know, they had to have everything manicured, you know, um, and it, a kid like myself would do it for five or seven dollars as opposed to maybe paying 15 or 20 dollars to a professional car. And there weren't that many professional, at least I don't remember very many professional lawn care people like there are today. They're, now they're everywhere, you know, but so I didn't have to competition. <laughs> <laughs> Now, into something that I feel like is more, you know, up your alley regarding uh, you being a guitarist. What influenced you to get into playing the guitar to begin with? 
that's just something I picked up. I, I, uh, uh, I heard a, a folk singer on the radio when I was like five or six years old. Uh, not on the radio, but on, on like Mr. Rogers or something, you know, one of those TV shows, Channel 3. And, it, you know, I started to, and I just kept on going with it. And, and um, but I did tell you one thing, when I was 17, one of my, one of the people I really liked was George Benson. And I got to meet him, and it was funny. He played at um, uh, uh, Curtis Hicks and Hall, I believe it was. And uh, I, I went, and it was like yeah, I had nosebleed seats, you know, to see him. I could barely see him. So I, I thought, wow, man, I would love to meet him, you know. And I had this guitar pick, and I want to give it to him. Like, you know, like, like that would mean a lot to him, right? So I found out that he, they rented burn steakhouse which is a very nice steakhouse in south tampa so mm. and uh so i went over there and you know when you're when you're 17 years old and you're stupid you just kind of do stuff you know and very impulsively so i i walked around the back and there was a waiter i said hey is george benson here yeah he says yeah him and his whole entourage and he goes you can go you can go see him if you want said, really so i go through and i had to duck through this like um a four foot um a uh, cubby hole to get through from the outside to the inside. I don't know, maybe they used it for trash or something. But I walk through there and I open up this, this big buffet table and everybody's sitting down there and I focus right on George Benson. He's there. I mm -hmm. can't believe this. So there was an empty chair to the right of him. So I just walked over there and sat there and I just sat there like this. And, and I didn't say, I didn't, he was talking. I didn't want to interrupt him, you know? I mean, this is my idol. I didn't want to interrupt him. And then uh, so he goes, George, George, I think somebody wants to talk to you. And I, I got to ask him some questions. And one of the things he said, and I asked him, you know, what, you know, I just asked him probably a lot of stupid questions. And um, one of the things he told me is, whatever you do, play from here. I'm pointing in my heart. Play from here. And, um, mm. and then the same thing with art, too. You know, do it emotion with emotion. I never did give him my guitar pick, though. I totally forgot. <laughs> I thought, oh, man, I forgot to give him my guitar pick, you know? So. Uh, that's a nice moment. And, and George Benson, uh, can you give us some background about George Benson for those of us who, uh, who don't know? Um, I would definitely Google it and uh, put him on YouTube on, like, a take five from 1977 or something. I mean, the guy was a genius. It, it, again, I'm talking, what, it, he is a genius. He's still out there playing, and, mm. and uh, he, he's, he's probably 80 years old, but he's amazing. Um, he, he, if you've ever heard of Wes Montgomery, he's like the one that took over the reins after Wes Montgomery, one of the foremost jazz blues uh, guitarists um, ever, you know, in my opinion. I mean, there's so many players now, but I mean, he's just a natural um, just an amazing player. Nice. And singer, too. Wow. Amazing singer. Can you, uh, uh, was it difficult to manage being a guitarist and go to college at the same time? It was actually cool um, because I, <laughs> I had like 55, 60 students and I could make my own hours. And if they wanted me as a teacher, they'd have to come in on Mondays instead of Tuesdays because or Tuesdays instead of Mondays because I, you know, my schools would be like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday and Thursday on certain classes. So I, each semester I could rearrange my schedule, and that was cool. Um, and uh, then the only time, sometimes if we was playing at night, we'd play to three, like in a Holiday Inn, and then after that we'd rehearse for like the next night just to go through a few sets. So it's like five thirty or so, and I may have an eight o'clock class. You know, so basically I would just stay up, you know, and, and then after the eight o'clock class, I go, you know, take a nap or something and go to like a 10 o'clock or 11, whatever it was, you know, and then teach in the afternoon. But when you're young, you do stupid stuff like that, you know what I mean? 100%. Hold on. So let me get this straight. You were teaching, going to college and playing guitar simultaneously, doing all three? Yes. That's wow. through college. I, I had a scholarship for the first two years. I had a music scholarship. Then I switched my major to, to uh, social and behavioral science, a history major. And um, I didn't have a scholarship for that, but I, I, that's what I kind of enjoyed doing at the time. So, um, yeah, it was good, though. You know, I mean, it's, um, 
it was a good, uh, I'd say it was a very good experience. Interesting. Uh, can you tell us a story about one of the best moments you experienced as a guitarist? Um, the, a lot of them was not necessarily the clubs, but it was sometimes there'd be these like after parties. And mm -hmm. um, no, I can't tell. <laughs> 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 my, 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 uh, it's a little fuzzy, but I, I would say, in general, it's when I'm playing and I get w like in the zone and everything is mm -hmm. clicking. I'm feeling it's just a very zen type of thing. You know, it's hard to explain. And uh, the same thing with art. You know, it's it, you just everything clicks. You're feeling it, uh, and you're not thinking. You're just playing. Just the motive. Nice. What is one of the effects you think music has on the mind? Oh, my gosh. I, I, someone told me the other day that some of the best computer program, and I don't know, but this is what someone said, some of the best computer programmers that are being hired are creatives, not necessarily from the STEM, the science and, and math and all that. They're actually, even though it, you kind of associate it with science and math to be a, a software coder, they're looking at creative creatives because they think outside the box. So I think music and art and all that helps you to to not look at it, life through a little frame, you know, and you kind of think that you look at all the possibilities, not just this this much. And and there's nothing wrong with that. There's people, you need people to do that and do it really well. But then some to create something new and different, you have to think beyond that. And it's very natural for a creative to um, to think like that. And they get ridiculed for that, that too, a lot of times because, yes. right? You know, you're trying to function in society and you know, you're, we're trying to have a con concentration and now all of a sudden I'm talking about rocket ships or whatever, you know? It, it, it's hard, but you have to be patient because some of these people have a lot to offer. Yes, indeed. I, I feel the same way actually as a creative, that sometimes uh, people like to box me in. Mm -hmm. You know, especially with my vast ideas, I have very vast ideas. I'm what they call a big picture guy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yes, I have faced that before. Um, can you explain to us what social and behavior sciences is centered around? Just out of curiosity. Humanities. Uh, basically, the humanities, um, uh, history, uh, history, philosophy, and humanities. Interesting. And how can you, someone use that in their everyday life, if you don't mind me? I, I think it's just a good foundation, just a, just a, you know, just the basics, you know. Um, it's what you do after college that matters, you know. Um, it's certainly not necessary. I don't think it was a necessity. It's just at 18, 19, 20, 21, I, I was still teaching lots it could be five years to get a four-year degree because you know it's working mm -hmm. and um i think it it was just it was honestly it was something my mom wanted me to do she really pressed me she said if you have education that's something people can't take away from you you know and you get get educated so that she really pressed that but um and i don't regret it i don't regret getting the education i learned a lot it's actually it's like a zoo when you go you look at the monkeys you look at the zebras you look at the elephants, right? You go and look at, and everybody, you know, you might have a Marxist uh, teacher here. You might have uh, uh, a total right-wing guy here, this, and, and you get to see different personalities um, without even going in the workforce yet, you know, technically. Wow, interesting. Um, I, another, I, I just want to shift this conversation a little bit in a, in a different way. Uh, when you did real estate, um, why was it important to you at the time you said because it was something that you just needed to do it was a necessity or uh what was it about real estate that shifted you in that direction because you could have chose a wild variety of things to possibly do i do sense that you're an intelligent man so i, I well that you're, you're going a little on a limb for that one <laughs> <laughs> um i i read a book called uh, uh, i was in the it was supposed to be studying for a history test so i was in the library mm -hmm. And I read a book called Nothing Down by Robert Allen, which was one of these armchair type investors that would do the one of the first people to do these classes where, you know, take my seminar and um, I'll teach you how to buy uh, houses and 
shopping centers with nothing down, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So I read that and I got inspired. I said, well, wow, this might be a way to, you know, if I don't need money, that I could do this. So it, it, it wasn't as easy as he said it was, you know. So I, um, I got in, that, that's what inspired me to get in there is so I could make a living. Like I said, I didn't want to end up being poor. And that was my, you know, not that it didn't work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what was it like working in the real estate and, and industry and how did you feel about it? Well, um, I, I don't think I had the passion that I do for my art that I did that. I was excited. There were, there were moments of passion, you know, working mm-hmm. on deals and things that it was very exciting. And everybody was very nice to me. I think I, I made a lot of good friends in real estate and I, I don't regret it. The only thing I kind of regret is I didn't get back into my photography sooner than I did. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I just, that's, that's right now, it's just like a burning passion for me. Um, but I, I, I made a lot of good friends and I still have a lot of good friends from I made through my real estate. Interesting. So, so um, I know that you were influenced to do photography from a child. You know, I did read that inside your biography. Uh, what was one thing you remember about photography as a child that made you want to get into photography altogether? Um, I remember taking my cameras with me everywhere, you know, and taking pictures. Um, I don't know if I can tell you, I was very unschooled. I mean, my father taught me some basics, how to use mm-hmm. the camera, the aperture and f-stop and, and ISO. Um, but I, I wasn't really, I didn't have a lot of uh, books or, or that I didn't use a lot of books to get inspired by. I just like doing it. Um, and I, w- I don't think I was really that good, but some, it was the people. That was what it was. I remember in 1979 or so, or 80, uh, going and taking pictures every Tuesday morning uh, before I'd have to teach. And, and mm-hmm. I'd take pictures of people in the or city. And I'd go around my, with my camera talking to people. And it's like when you have a camera it, it, and you're basically an introvert, it's a license to be extroverted, right? Right, you see my camera. Say, what you gonna do with that? Well, it depends on what you you know. What is it okay if I take your picture? You know, where I may not have done that. I mean, I I still get nervous a little bit, and you know, talking to new people, like what, you know, asking them to, to let me take your picture and stuff like that. But it, I've met some really interesting people um, with the camera. Nice. What? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> what is the definition of lens-based photography? Well, it's basically my art is through my lens, mm-hmm. but the reason I don't just call myself a photographer is because I mix painting in with my p- photographs as well. Not all of them, just basically it's one body of work, and that's mm-hmm. the introspection series where I'll do either what they call double exposures, the two, two images on one, or I'll, I'll, I'll paint an abstract and then I blend it in with my photograph to get something a little bit different than I can't just do with a, a but that's why I call it lens based because they'll say, well, this isn't photography or it's not straight photography, you know, you're painting with it. So that's why I say lens base. Interesting. What do you feel when you're looking through your lens, getting ready to take a picture of another individual? It depends on who I'm, I'm, I'm with. Mm. I, I feel like I'm listening. Does, does that make sense? I, I, um, mm. I feel empathetic. I feel, I feel nothing of myself. I, I certainly don't feel judgmental. I, I, I feel I'm listening, you know? And if I take a picture of you, the way I consider it is you're giving me a gift. If you smile and all that, okay, no, that's not really the gift. The gift comes, I'll take a few pictures of you smiling and, and trying to look professional or distinguished or whatever it is. The gift comes in between those shots. I'll set the camera down, and then we start talking and start telling some funny jokes or something like that. 
Then I pick up the camera again. You're already used to me shooting, right? And you think we already got the shot, the shot, you know? But no, that's not, that's just a warm up. That's just to get you acclimated with hearing the shutter go. I shoot more when we're talking natural, like right now, click, you know? <laughs> Interesting. You yeah. catch the natural moment. I, I strive to, yeah. And um, because when people pose, I, I'll show you. You want to see some photos? Yes. Let me see. I'm going to turn the studio lights on. There's a glare when I when I do that. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, well, you already saw those. There's probably glares on them. Yeah, there is. It's so, fine. Let's see what we got here. I, I can't tell if this is working or not. It's working to oh. a degree. That's nice. Yes, I can see that one clearly. Yeah. Wow. His name was Ferdinand. And here, he's singing to me. He's got a cigarette in each hand. We're sitting under a billboard. And he's singing to me about, uh, in Spanish, about um, his, his homeland in Cuba. And, and then he'd sing something. And then he'd go and tell me in English what he, what he just sang. And then, you know, it was really cool. At one point he said, don't take the pictures. And I stopped and then he says, okay. He, he most of my, uh, and then I started taking the pictures and then and I got that one. I'm not well, used to using my, my phone. As a it's no problem, that's good right there, that's nice. Uh, yeah. uh, Can you step back for this one a little bit? Yeah. Wow, yeah. Well, these yeah. are big. I mean, to give you an idea of the size, these are like 33 by 33. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I, I got glare on there. It's no problem. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, really, you know, it, the best way is to look on the website. Yes, indeed. These are all from the Dignity series. This one's from Introspection. Interesting. And then there's hmm. some street photography and yeah, the glares are not really good. This is one of Ooh. my fathers. He did a uh, thing called uh, the Seven Deadly Sins. Interesting. He was the first uh, living artist to have a one-man show at Ringling Museum in 1965. Hmm. Let me see. I'm probably doing a really bad job of this. No, it's okay. It's a little bit crooked, but you're fine. I'm sorry. Probably going to make everybody nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no problem. Moving the camera Move around. The anyway, that, that's the studio. That's part of it. Let me sir. Okay. So, um, I want to ask you, why do you find it... <clears throat> important to take pictures of what is considered to be the invisible class of society, the homeless? Well, like I was saying, you know, that basically if I, 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 if I think a torn poster is important enough to show his art, you know, mm -hmm. naturally human being, I want to show them, I want to, I want to highlight them. Um, but what you brought up was such an interesting question. I, um, in 70, I took a picture of an old man, an old black man with a cigar, and I asked if I could take his picture. This is before we got people's stories and stuff. You know, I was just taking pictures. And I left, and he goes, well, why? And I said, well, well why what? He said, why did you want my picture? I just thought, you know, your face and see, I'll, everything I've been around is Renaissance art up until that time because my, my father, you know, and my mother, mm -hmm. they like the Renaissance art. And so figures the human figure was art to me the human face so i never considered anything else and he goes well why aren't you taking pictures of these beautiful buildings and and this kind of thing and i didn't have an answer for him i just said well your face looks cool and the cigar and all that you know he goes but is it art so i call him socrates mm -hmm. head and it, it it took it it threw me for a little while because it it made i i i, I stuck on that for like a year you know, why do I think that's, that's art and maybe, you know, something else isn't, uh, something abstract, for instance, or something uh, more colorful that's not a 
a person, you know, something that, like a torn poster, right? So mm -hmm. that really, it was like an epiphany for me because this old man asked me this question, why did I think his face was interesting as art? And I wish I had a picture here for you. I, uh, I think it's on the website in one of the backstories, but it was, it was interesting. But um, yeah, it, for me, up until that point in my life, art had to do with the figure or the face, because that's pretty much what I was exposed to growing up. And then, of course, now I love abstract and I live with all now, you know. Wow, interesting. What is, uh, I wanted to also uh, lead back to the main question of, uh, is that why you find it important to take pictures of what is considered to be the invisible society? Um, yeah, basically, my mother was a social worker and she ended up with a high school education went started working for two dollars an hour eventually went on after i even got out of the house to get her master's in social work and she became a counselor and she would counsel people and i was always we we were always back and forth you know i said you know these people need a job mom you know they, they you know they, you can't help them you know they got to help themselves mm -hmm. and she goes oh no you don't understand you can't judge somebody until you know what they've been through uh, you, you can't judge people personally cause, at, at all because you don't know what they've been through. And um, I never got that, you know. And then, mm. it, 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 you know, I started taking pictures and I was curious to some people. And I'd ask people, you know, what, why are you here and all that. And, um, and I finally learned, you know, this there but for the grace of God go I because anything can happen to us. And... Um, so, yeah, it, 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 I, I think it's very important to call attention to people that are not doing as well as ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone did have a question that I wanted to implement sure. before I continue. Uh, they said, uh, how do you go about doing your framing? I don't do it myself. I, I've hired, I hired somebody who actually made some custom frames for my uh, big shows. Um, but I have a framer, uh, framers in South Tampa that I've used. Um, usually it's the, the I, I just, it, the, the, when I do sell something, I sell a print and I bring mm -hmm. it to the client and they have a conservator. Of, they, uh, usually my, the people that buy my stuff are collectors and they, they'll have a conservator they bring it to and they do the framing because they, they may want it with a mat. They may not want it with a mat. I've printed on metal before, though. You know, I depend on, you know, uh, I've, I've done all kinds of stuff like that. Wow. But usually, I guess, to answer his question, I don't really handle the framing myself. I have someone do it. Interesting. How was it to print on metal? Like, what is that experience like? I'm confused. Uh, partially confused as to how that process is. Um, and also just, like, what that looks like. Like. <laughs> you some um it, it, it it's kind of a fad right now people are doing it like crazy but i have a place called white wall in in um in germany and they convert my digital files to an analog file like the old-fashioned with the dark room and they put mm -hmm. a developer with a stop bath and the fixer in, a, in 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 the dark and then they mount it on metal thick metal that it's called diabond it's quarter inch aluminum and um and then they cover it with the uv protective coating so it's really cool i can show you a couple um let me see yeah. can you uh this one you see that yes i can all right now this can you see the the side of it uh no you gotta hold on it's a little too bright um, well, it's quarter inch metal, it, and it's uh, called Dibon. Can you uh, focus it on there again? Can you move back a little bit? Let me see. I'm sorry. I'm not. Yeah. Wow. That's a nice picture, though. That's cool. Yeah, he's on the, nice. on the website. Um, yeah, I got. Yeah. See, usually what I do is I sell the print. And, oh, okay. Uh, you know, and, and uh, someone 
and and basically ship it to them or if it's a big collector i'll i'll, I'll hand carry it over you know if it's close by and um and they, and they bring it to their own person so what they said the metal piece was awesome yeah they, they, the white wall does it they can do it on that I, i've got one in glossy too uh maybe if i do less lights it'll that one was matt that he saw this one is from my introspection series that's metal wow and it's glossy yes it is yeah and you can definitely see the shiny. this is another metal one this is a sample uh what am i doing here that's metal maybe that you can see it yeah I'm i can sorry, not see i can see it. i can see a little bit of it yes yeah. the side the thickness of it yeah. yes wow but yeah and then I, i've got other samples and stuff you can see those are just what i use for samples hmm. yeah. um I wanted to continue and ask you another question of, in your opinion, why, what, in your opinion, why are homeless people considered to be the invisible class in today's society? Um, I call them that, <laughs> and I know other people do, and I think I can qualify that a little bit by saying they're either invisible or they're visible as a label or they're in, in <laughs> They're in the way. They're a nuisance. They're sleeping in the portico of your store, and you got to get them out of there so you can open your store, which is understandable. So they're not, not necessarily invisible. They used to be invisible. Now we're getting so many more homeless people, it's coming to the forefront um, that they can be, be considered a nuisance by society or mm. invisible. And either way, they're invisible. And this is what I'm getting at. This is why I work so hard on my doing the point of view of my photographs, where you get to see the people face to face, like uh, on these two photographs, for instance. Right. Um, right. Okay, you're looking eye to eye to them, right? You're not. None of my photographs where you see a guy passed out on the street. You know, that's what people see when they see homeless. You think of oh, bum. He's passed out. He's He's got an addiction problem, which a lot of them do. But I want you to see that, that you know, before this happened, and, and they may have done it to themselves, I get that. But before this happened, they were a human being. They're still a human being. But I mean, they had, you know, they had dreams and hopes and aspirations, and they were like us, you know, but some, they chose a path or saw a path happen to them. Um, I mean, there's there's people out there that you know they just something snaps you know in in their mind, and and they they become uh, extremely bipolar. Um, and there's all, all different types of things. I don't know all the terminology for it, but you know, there. But for the grace of God, go I is is you know it's so easy to for people to say, oh, that would never happen to me, you know. Um, but it's you don't know, you don't know that. Um, but but as far as the uh, uh, how how people are, are seen, um, you don't you see what's called a construct. You see a homeless person, a bum. You don't see that his name is Ferdinand. You know you don't see the person. You see the construct that society paints for you. A homeless person, you know, a homeless person. Oh no, th this name's Mario. This name's Fer Fernand. You know, Ferdinand. The the people. And yep. with names, and and at one time they had families, and maybe they still do. I don't know. It depends on the situation, but um, that that's what I'm trying to do is show that that these are human beings. That's why the point of view of my stuff, I get very close with my lens, very close, uncomfortably close, and I want you to see them as a person, not their um, blanket and their 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 food or whatever, not 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 their circumstance. I focus my lens. Mm -hmm humanity not their circumstance amazingly said that was great hmm. how did you come up with the title of your book D dignity no matter what the light within um 
dignity no matter what i know the grammar doesn't sound right and i didn't care about that because these people have dignity no matter what they've been through mm. because that's the last thing to go is dignity right i mean you know you, you lose you lose your livelihood you lose your family you lose this you lose that you that but you hold on to every little bit of dignity and you can tell because someone's going to paint a different persona when i first meet them oh yeah oh yeah, i'm doing good or i have some this or that or whatever and then you start finding out a little bit more and you know the guard comes down a little bit and you get to learn a bit. so that's where the title comes dignity no matter what the light within is that dignity that's always there hopefully it's always there i mean people do get broke down but you know that that's basically it yes indeed Someone asked, uh, uh, do you think the homeless uh, is everywhere in America or only in certain regions? It's, it's mostly in big cities. Mm. And it's very prevalent in big cities in Chicago, uh, Boston, New York, uh, LA, Skid Row, obviously, you know, it's notorious for that. So yeah, any big, here in Tampa, you know, we, wherever we have, there's a big city because that's where all the social service agencies would be and everybody gravitates there and we actually have homeless that come from up north in the summer uh in the winter time and they'll ride the the, the uh, like what they call hobos you know they ride the train and yes, come down do. here because a lot of people yeah. don't know but hobo means homeward bound so a hobo was somebody that was basically tried to make it in hollywood or whatever and then couldn't make it so he's homeward bound but he ends up on the a railroad but we get a lot of people uh, coming from uh, weather to here in the winter months, right? and they're right yeah, near cold here. weather to Florida. Yes, I was one of those people. Oh, <laughs> That's how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came down in the flood. Well, I mean, a small backstory about me: I was homeless for fifteen years, so I know every aspect of what being homeless is. So, um, but moving forward, um, <clears throat> I see you donated the proceeds of the book sales to a local homeless charity. How did you go about finding the charity that uh, that you felt was going to stay true to their cause of helping the homeless? I somehow, I connected uh, uh, with Beth uh, Ross, and she was the founder. And she it, it was just her and her husband, and she had a group of volunteers. And there was no middle management. There was no, I, I, how do I say without sounding bad but you know charities do a wonderful thing for society and i'm not down downing that but i didn't have that much money to do that so mm -hmm. i wanted every dollar to count so i looked for a charity that didn't have any administration she didn't work for a salary he didn't work for a salary the volunteers were volunteers so any dollar i could put for went 100 percent toward um blankets backpacks um uh, black backpacks or the thing socks are a big thing it went right to her stuff yes indeed wow I, yeah I'd rec if you look on my website you know you can look at you can look at the um dignity series and get a, an idea of, of who i've met indeed i have to take a look at your website it's amazing i'm going to go ahead and post uh after the interview once we awesome. get your interview out there some more content from you so other people could take a look at your website awesome. also. Awesome. Yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> so what is the feeling you get? Well, how does it feel to work, to have your work, excuse me, shown in multiple galleries and museums around the United States? Well, it's, it's a good feeling. I, I, I'll tell you a story. I, I had a show at the Museum of Art in Deland, and um, it's a one-man show, and Mar this one Mario, um, and uh, I'll just show you this one real quick. Let me see. Mm -hmm. This sure. guy. He's a friend of mine. Uh, not him. Mario. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Big, big. I don't have enough room to, to go back. Anyway, so we, we would get together every week. And we'd walk the areas just north of uh, Ybor City and north of uh, downtown. And he would pick up cans with his little picker-upper thing. And I would take pictures. And we can be good friends. And he's not homeless now. Um, 
but he um, w he was in the show, and I said, "Do you want to? Do you want me to take you over there?" He goes, "No, I'm not really feeling good about it." He goes, "You know, there's a lot of people looking at that that picture. They really like it." He goes, "Well, mm -hmm. he, he's Spanish and he has this accent." He goes, "Well, were there a lot of women's?" And I said, "Yeah, there's a lot of women looking at that." And and I said, "Mario, you know, he's 73 years old." I said Mario, how about if I, you know, they have a little name card, uh, like a little label card next to it, you know, that, that tells about the of art. How about if I put your phone number on that? He goes, could you do that? I said, no, Mario. I... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but he, he did like the idea that he was in a museum. Wow, amazing! So you getting to see someone else else's joy from being featured in a place where other people can see them uh, brings you joy in itself, and, too. And the label card would tell their story, you know, tell something about them. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing. You know, a lot of people, they, they want to be seen, but, you know, not as a homeless person. They want to see as a human being. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the, the effort that I made in this particular um, project. Wow. wow. Interesting. I see you're a grant recipient, excuse me. Um, what were some steps you took to accomplish this? How, how did that work out? Like, did you face hardships while you were going uh, to get the grant? I know a lot of other artists uh, in, you know, certain areas would like to hear some backstory. About this. I think every count, well, I don't know. I, I know Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, and it, 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 I know there's people from different parts of the country, but um, I assume that there's every county or city, many of them will have a grant program. And you go mm. to the website and find out the application process. And it's a matter of submitting um, your project and submitting the images that you've made in the past and give them an idea of what you want to do in the future. Mm. Is, uh, would you say it's difficult to get a grant? Oh, yeah, depending on on which one i mean some are easier than others you know i mean um it, it just depends on the grant you know it's like hmm. it's difficult to get a job it depends on the job you know it, it it's so so various interesting what is some advice that you have <clears throat> for someone who is trying to get into photography well uh there's so many aspects there's people that make a living like uh, wedding photographers and uh, commercial photographers. There's so much. Um, I don't know much about that. I mean, all I know is, is like, I would call it fine art photography. And for, for me, I, I do what I want to do in, in my photography, not what's expected. So, and then that's probably a lesson I was saying earlier that I got my, from my father. Um, because otherwise I might as well go back, you know, doing real estate or something. If I'm, if, if I'm not doing what I'm passionate about, I can do probably make a lot more money in the real estate if, you know, and, and, and still have fun, you know, but I'm, I'm just, you know, and you had talked about one time about leaving a legacy behind mm -hmm. well, doing that with my artwork. It's very important to me to do things with quality. And that's what I, and, and and things that are me, not what Troy wants or someone wants. I want to do what I need to do. And, right. uh, you know, again, it's a lesson I learned from my mom and my father. Nice. Nice. Okay. And that's the advice that you would give someone is for them to follow their passion uh, of what they want to do. To thy own self be true. Uh, I did notice that you are a father. Um, I didn't speak about this earlier, but I usually ask a, a question uh, regarding uh, fatherhood. And I just wanted to ask you this question. I asked someone else's question in the last interview. Uh, it's a pretty tough question. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, what is one thing that being a father taught you about being a man? Well, I have two daughters. And, mm -hmm. and nothing can scare me because I have two daughters. <laughs> <laughs> I... I Actually, I think it, again, it's probably because it's daughters, you know, but I've learned to be empathetic. And 
to really understand another point of view. And obviously, as a father, you're protective. And that comes out as a man. You're protective over your family. Um, but yeah, I would say the one thing is, is you know, you've you got two ears and one mouth, and you listen more than you talk, and try to do it in that proportion. Mm. And also be empathetic while you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, because that, that's, I've learned so much from being a father. Um, but that, that's, that's one of the first things that comes to my mind is, is to be empathetic and definitely not to judge. But I've probably learned that from my mom, not to be judgmental. Mm. I even Do you think judgment, I actually want to ask you a question about judgment. Because I think judgment is not, well, it's judgment and discernment. It's a thin line between those two. Uh, I generally do think that judgment is not a bad thing. I think it's how we kind of uh, discern who we want around us and who we don't and who's good for us and who's not. So with that being said, do you think that judgment is a, a bad thing? Yes, I still do. I think discernment mm -hmm. is you can discern who you want to be with, them, right? But mm -hmm. judge one more step and it's saying, you know, that guy is not doing what he should be doing or he, he's not a good quality person or whatever it is that's the judgment discernment means i just don't want to hang around that person because he's not really what i want to be around but judgment takes it one step further and 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 it, it has a connotation of of um of judging of, of putting value on another person and i i don't mm. like that i like the idea of discerning if, if like if, if you were around me and you just have yeah, Ron, you know, you're a little too creative or too artsy. I don't want to be around you. You know, that's fine, you know, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know my history. So to judge that, you know, and say, well, Ron should be doing much better or doing so much different and make an actual value judgment on me, that's different. You see what I'm saying? As discerning and just saying, well, this is not the type of friend I want around. That's cool. You know, that, that, and, and, and that's discernment and discernment is, is healthy. It's healthy, but I think judgment, because you don't know, like my mom said, you know, you don't know what somebody's been through. So, you know, if I were to judge you and, um, you know, I, I, it's just, it, or you were to judge me, it's just not, it, you don't know what we, we've been through. Wow. Interesting. I like the way you made that, uh, that, that uh, you made the clear difference between judgment and discernment. Excuse me. I like the way that you done that. Um, what is one aspect about the old days that you hope remains preserved in the future generations to come? Um, I think there was a certain value to our old people. I'm not just saying I'm getting old, but what I mean, there's a certain value to say if, if, if someone was 75, 80 years old, you know, they had some experiences that you didn't have and mm -hmm. learn from that. You can learn vicariously through their wisdom. Hopefully they've got more wisdom, not always. Now young people kind of think, you know, oh, they're a baby boomer. They don't know anything, you know. Um, they don't know what the world's like today because it, it was such a different world. Um, that, that's, that's one thing. I would hope that they would learn to respect the wisdom that comes with experience. Mm. Um, and then, of course, that we talked about the interconnectivity and all that, you know, kids are, uh, are brought up with electronic babysitters, you know, I mean, they got the iPhones when they're four years old or whatever. And, and, uh, and that becomes their friend, you know, I mean, it's just like, I, you know, there's no real interaction. I fear that a lot of the, the younger people, I mean, just now growing up, aren't going to be able to have a conversation like you and I are having. And, and be able to relate and come back and forth and, and you know, and, and disagree and, and, and things. I, I fear that that's becoming a, a dying attribute. Yes. I fear the same thing too, my friend. I do. Um, and last, last but not least, um, what, what does being human mean to you? Uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind is empathy. To understand, mm. you know, I, I know a little bit about your background you know a little bit about my background you know you know that i lost my father at a young age you know it may affect things that i don't even understand mm -hmm. um you uh 
empathy and, and judgment is a big thing about being human, not to judge, to discern. That's fine, but not to judge uh, because I don't know what you've been through. I mean, who knows? I, I may not be going, I may not be half as strong as you to be homeless for 15 years. You know, I mean, I've seen what some of these people go through. Um, I don't know that I would be strong enough, to be honest with you, you know, so I, I don't judge them. Now, I, you know, I can, I'm, I'm only human, you know, I see somebody that's always on the streets, been addicted for five or six years, you know, it's just like, well, at some point, they got to help themselves. And, 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 and they do. And it, it's about believing in themselves that they can do it. They have to have self respect, and they have to believe in themselves. Mm. Yes, indeed. Well, that brings us to the end of our interview. I want to say thank you, uh, Renato, for coming on for sure. Um, do you have any last closing remarks for the audience? You could also tell them where they can find your work at. I will also be sharing it. The interview will be coming out 24 hours uh, from the, the close of it. Yes. No, I think, I think um, you, know, I, you know, just to be clear, I, I also do landscapes. I, I, I shoot uh, street photography. I've got mm -hmm. my, my landscapes are called Spiritual Cleanse, where it's getting out of nature and taking pictures. Uh, so I try to balance it. I'm in the urban areas doing urban decay, right? Torn posters, people living on the streets. Mm -hmm. I also go into nature and take pictures there. Um, I, I love doing street photography. That's how I kind of got into this, taking pictures, candid pictures of people. Not, I don't take candid pictures of homeless people because they can't get away. They, you know, they're out on the street. They can't go into the home and hide. Um, but I take candid pictures of people on the street, you know? And um, I think just, I'm not an expert on homelessness, but I have met a lot of homeless people, as you can see on my website. And I would say to be empathetic and try your best not to be judgmental. Yes, indeed. And where can pe people find you, by the way, oh, before we go? Just wanted to, Renato you know. Rampola, all one word, uh, RenatoRampola.com. Okay. And there's RenatoRampola.com. You can see my website. You can see my work. Is it, is, is it the same for Instagram, yeah. too? Yes, Renato Rampola. And are, are there copies of your book available for purchase that they can purchase also on the website? Yeah, I, I sold out of the, the uh, Dignity No Matter What, but now because so many people ask, I, I did a collector edition, and it's available through the website, and it's what's called print on demand. Mm -hmm. And so they could buy it that way. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. It's got some interesting stories and quotes in there. Nice, nice. Okay. I wanted to make sure I did my due diligence on people being able to find your work because I do believe that it can have a great impact on people. Um, so without further ado, I want to say thank you again, Renato Rampola, for coming on and sharing your story with us today. And to the audience, I will see you next time. Hopefully we have another interview lined up for you next week. And we have the Return to Campfire sessions coming soon at the end of this month. But before I go, I want to let everybody know to remember that we are all human. And I will see you next time here on Human. All right. Have a good one. And goodbye. You're welcome. No problem at all. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.